Hello, thank you for joining me again. For the continuation of her secret name, we will look at the Norns, Pharaoh Hetzshepsut, and the Greek poet Sappho today. The Norns. The place of women in Norse history has long been a strange, in a strange state of dispute. Clearly, they are revered and respected in the literature and the material data, has shown care and respect for them in life and death issues. So here are three of the seemingly most important in the daily lives of humans and gods and goddesses, the Norns. They live beneath the world tree, Ildrassel, and weave the tapestry of fate with each person's life represented as a string in the loom. One Norn spins the thread of each life, another measures its length, and the third decides when to snap it. The length of the string corresponds to the length of the person's life. The Norns are said to have supernatural insight and understanding of others' past choices and nature, allowing them to predict the future. The Norns are often depicted as aged, gray-headed hags and are respected for their immense power over the destinies of both gods and humans. They are also frequently in attendance at births and are sometimes associated with midwifery. The Norns are three giantesses who embody and represent different aspects of destiny and time. Urd represents fate and the past. Verdandi represents necessity and the present. Schooled represents being and the future. The Norns are also described as maidens of Vogprasir. In the Voluspa, they are described as powerful maiden giantesses, Jotuns, whose arrival from Jotunheimer ended the golden age of the gods. The Norns are responsible for the fates of all beings, including the gods, and are considered to be some of the most powerful beings in the universe. They are also said to make laws, allot futures to newborn children, carve runes into the bark of Ildrassel to guide and determine the lives of all humans, protect people of earth as protective spirits, hamingas, speak and iterate prophecies. Weaving has always been associated with feminine power. What greater respect can there be that women are identified with holding the fate of all men and women and even the gods? Yet it is attested to and accepted as truth. Our next is Hetshepsut a pharaoh of Egypt. Hetshepsut was an Egyptian pharaoh who ruled from around 1479 BC to 1458 BC. She was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and Egypt's second confirmed queen, regent. Hetshepsut was the daughter of King Tutmos I and Amos, and became queen when she married her half-brother, Tutmos II, around age 12. After Tutmos II died, she acted as regent for her stepson, Tutmos III, before taking on the full powers of a pharaoh and becoming co-ruler of Egypt around 1473 BC. Hetshepsut's reign was a period of great artistic creativity and was fully accepted by a flourishing Egypt. Praise for Cleopatra may be the most famous woman of ancient Egypt, but far more significant was Hatshepsut, a female pharaoh who reigned for nearly 40 years in the 15th century BC. During the early period of the New Kingdom, <clears throat> after acting as regent for her young nephew stepson, Tutmos III, Hatshepsut assumed the title of king 
and exercised the full powers of the throne as senior co-ruler with Tutmos. In accordance with Egyptian ideology, the representational tradition, she was often depicted as a male king. Hatshepsut's reign, fully accepted by a flourishing Egypt, introduced a period of immense artistic creativity. Hatshepsut is often depicted as a male king in art with muscles and a beard. However, she always made sure that the art included a reference to being a woman, such as daughter of Re or his majesty herself. I love that. Her mortuary temple, De Jezer De Jezeru, which means holy of holies, was built into the cliffs of Deir al-Bahri in western Thebes and is considered one of the most impressive architectural achievements in the ancient world. Hatshepsut is, according to Egyptologist James Henry Breasted, the first great woman in history of whom we are informed. In some ways, Hatshepsut's reign was seen as going against the patriarchal system of her time. She managed to rule as regent for a son who was not her own, going against the system which had previously only allowed mothers to rule on behalf of their biological sons. She used this regency to create her female kingship, constructing extensive temples to celebrate her reign, which meant that the public became used to seeing a woman in such a powerful role. This ensured that when the oracle declared her king, the Egyptian public readily accepted her status. Hatshepsut died in Thebes on January 16th, 1458 BC. Our next is Greek poet Sappho. Sappho, she lived from 620 to 570 BCE and was a Greek poet from Lesbos who is known for her lyric poetry, which was written to be sung with music. Her work was so popular that she was honored in pottery, coinage, and statuary centuries after her death. Sappho is considered one of the greatest lyric poets of all time and was called the Tenth Muse by Plato. She was so popular in ancient Greece that people made pottery about her for centuries after her death. Little remains of her work and these fragments suggest she was gay. Her name inspired terms, the terms sapphic and lesbian, both referencing female same-sex relationships. Sappho's work is known for its beauty, concise phrasing, and directness. She innovated the lyric meter and first-person narration, and her language includes elements of aeolic vernacular speech, aeolic poetic tradition, and epic vocabulary. Sappho's work often explores themes of love and sexism, and she encouraged women to embrace their sexuality and live freely. Her name inspired the terms sapphic and lesbian, which both refer to female same-sex relationships. Sappho's most famous work is Fragment 31, which is one of her most frequently adapted and translated poems. It has been the subject of more scholarly commentary than any other of her works. The Poems of Sappho, a collection translated by John O'Hara includes over 75 poems such as Ode to Aphrodite, The Roses, Eros, and The Swallow. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to read Ode to Aphrodite for you now so that you have a little taste of how she wrote. Aphrodite, subtle of soul and deathless, daughter of God, weaver of wiles, I pray thee, neither with care, dread mistress, nor with anguish, slay thou my spirit. But in pity hasten, come now, 
if ever from afar of old when my voice implored thee. Thou hast deigned to listen, leaving the golden house of thy father. With thy chariot yoked, and with doves that drew thee, fair and fleet around the dark earth from heaven, dripping vibrant wings down the azure distance, through the mid-ether. Very swift they came, and thou, gracious vision, leaned with face that smiled in immortal beauty. Leaned to me and asked what misfortune threatened, why I had called thee, what my frenzied heart craved in utter yearning, whom its wild desire would persuade to passion, what disdainful charms, madly worshipped, slight thee. Who wrongs thee, Sappho? She that fain would fly, she shall quickly follow. She that now rejects, yet with gifts shall woo thee. She that heeds thee not, soon shall love to madness. Love thee, one lo loath love, one. Come to me now thus, goddess, and release me from distress and pain. And all my distracted heart would seek, do thou once again, fulfilling, be still be my ally. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and sub. It helps me out a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye.